this yeah. is such a powerful tool to treat words. But wow. anyway, you're so, so science based that that would be like the last thing I'd expect you right. to say. You know? We are here with Dr. Stephen Philipson, um, who we're going to set the table. We're going to explain how we got here. But Dr. Philipson is a psychologist that I'm working with currently. I've been seeing for the last couple months um, for some of my own things that I've been dealing with my whole life. And um, before we get into that, I'm going to ask you, because I don't want to butcher your bio, so I'm going to ask you what you do, uh, who you are, where you came from, and all that fun stuff. Okay. Um, my uh, father was a psychologist, and so uh, he died when I was two. And as, as much as you can see from my office, I'm traditional. Yeah. Uh, I feel like so, we're in a, in a living room. Yeah, in, in a, a living in, room. In a grandma's, grandma's living room. Grandma's living room here. Uh, so I thought uh, of the different careers, maybe it'd be nice to kind of honor his memory by following in his footsteps and becoming a psychologist myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I got a PhD from Hofstra University, did uh, two internships, one's at, one at Johns Hopkins Hospital and one at the Institute for Behavioral Therapy. Uh, I've been a professor at uh, Hofstra University for, actually adjunct professor for four years. And actually I uh, taught hypnosis was the single class mm -hmm. that I uh, worked with. Which I just found out can get rid of warts. Uh, we'll I, get, I we'll, know we'll no get one into believes that. <laughs> it. When I, when I tell people, you know, as a scientist uh, that I have studied and taught hypnosis, they think that I'm completely crazy. Yeah, but um, because it's so far afield from the scientist that I am and the behavioral work that I do. Yeah. Anyway, so back to the, back to the bio. I um, started out specializing in eating disorders. That's what my met, my PhD thesis was, and um, along the way in my internship, I worked for and with what was then Manhattan's number one guy for OCD, and I really liked the way he thought about things, the way he treated things very scientific, very data-based. What uh, was his name? His name is Gordon Ball. Okay. Um, and uh, he's a guy with a great British accent. Uh, Half the battle. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I always say people sound smarter when they have British accents. He sounded very intelligent. <laughs> uh, so I started treating OCD and developed a specialty, not only working with OCD, but also all forms of anxiety. Mm. Um, I now have specialties in anxiety. I work a lot with relationships. I work a lot with sex therapy, although no one knows me for those things. I'm, I'm sort of typecast. Uh, mm -hmm. I joke around that a patient might say, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a patient might say, uh, uh, hey, Steve, is it okay if I mention that my girlfriend broke up with me yesterday? I'm like, oh no, no. Unless it's hand washing, I don't want to hear about it, mm. you know? But uh, no, I work with uh, nah. a full range of. You got game, you know. We we talk about dating, you know. He's teaching me how to how to text the ladies. I never I never thought that I needed I needed advice in that department, but uh, no, it's well, a lot of people a lot of people look at relationships as uh, a, a goal to be achieved or a trophy to be won, rather than just a person to, you know, kind of connect with and and find a compatible partner. Yeah, we'll get into that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <clears throat> And now I, and for the past uh, 30 years, um, actually about 25, I'm, I'm the director of an outpatient center. Mm -hmm. We predominantly treat OCD. That's what we're most known for. Uh, and we work with people literally all around the world uh, through video conferencing. Um, and uh, there's a staff now of about 18 uh, clinicians here that um, we provide a lot of training for mm -hmm. local doctoral programs. Um, and there are licensed staff that also provide uh, supervision. So basically, that's kind of what got me here now. And I've, I've written uh, extensively on uh, the treatment and understanding of OCD, mm -hmm. and that's why I have developed kind of a world-renowned reputation as that one specialty. Um, I'm just really very frustrated by tremendous amount of ignorance that exists still in, in society about this very confusing condition and anxiety in general. And so I've written extensively on articles to, you know, really educate 
the patient population to make sure that if they're seeking treatment, that they know that they're getting qualified, uh, you know, treatment and what that looks like. Right. Because that's so what I wanted to kind of clarify, like, um, we're going to be using a lot of different terminology here, like OCD, anxiety. Um, and OCD, by the way, stands for obsessive, obsessive compulsive, compulsive disorder. Which I think the first thing people think of when they hear that is hand washing, touching door. You know, everyone says, I have OCD. Yeah, a lot I'm, of people, so, I'm so OCD about yeah, that. Almost like it's like a badge of honor and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, like, when I was researching a therapist to go to, which we can talk about why I feel that's like a mess in itself. Because everyone is saying different things when you, do, you know... There's psychologists versus psychiatrists versus psychotherapists, and we can get into the difference between that. But, um, you know, I saw that you had written an article called Choice, which I'll put the link in this video. I encourage everyone to read it. We're going to talk about that. That's like, I think that that's really how you guys should dive into this and getting to know you is reading Choice and starting there. By the um, way, uh, just warn uh people that it's 47 pages single space it went by pretty quickly for me uh many people when i ask oh did you finish it i'd say 80 percent say mostly mm -hmm. uh, but there is a good news there is an audio version i actually hired a voiceover person to okay. turn it into an audio uh form. Well, i'll put the link to whatever and yeah. people can you know digest it and also obviously this podcast and choice itself as you say, in in is it the choice or choice? Choice. Choice. Um, isn't like a substitute for treatment or right. therapy, right. Um, but definitely I think a good starting point. Yeah. I meant it as kind of a guideline for um, how to treat OCD in particular, but also uh, how to understand the way the, the mind works, how to understand why our, our mind operates in the way that it does largely, mm -hmm. understand how to really <clears throat> optimize therapy. Uh, what what to look for in therapy, how to participate in therapy, as someone who can then derive the best dividend from attending therapy. And I just want to also add, I do something that is uh, extremely unique as a clinician, and that is I encourage all of my patients to record mm -hmm. every meeting that we have and to listen to that meeting in between. You know, to me, a, a patient purchases that time mm -hmm. and in listening to themselves and in listening to some of the ideas that I offer, you can actually gain more information by re-listening to the meeting, to the yeah. session than actually being in it in the first place. Yeah. I can attest to that. And also you have it forever. Yeah. It's not just like some session that came and went. It's like your own personal audio book that you yeah. can. Do you find in re-listening to our meetings that you gain more from the re-listen or from the actual meeting? Definitely from the re-listen. Isn't that sure. crazy? You pick up a lot of things right. that you didn't pick up on. Um, it just like hits you differently when you're walking your dog Yeah, three It's days incredible later. to me that so few people, and I don't know actually of any other clinician mm. that almost requires their patients to not only record it, but the first thing I often ask people when they come in is, did you listen to last week's meeting? Mm, right. Uh, and uh, there's about a 70% that say they do, and it's always incredible to me that they wouldn't. So, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the choice, but what I really wanted to start off, you know, because people are going to hear the word OCD a lot because that's what you specialize in, but that's not necessarily why I see you. Um, you know, I, I, I think I might have some OCD tendencies, but um, really I'll give a little bit of my own bio for people that forgot or, um, you know, maybe there's new listeners and stuff, but um, I've been... I feel like I've had some kind of anxiety, panic disorder uh, my whole life. Um, you know, I've had a little bit of depression. It reminds me of this comedian. She says that she alternates anxiety during the week, depression on the weekends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, people have seen it on my TV shows. I've, I've left, physically have left the show on TV. It's a reality show where yeah. you're documenting it. Um, I wrote a book that kind of, I co-wrote a book that shared my story. I got really into like self-help books and stuff like that back then, which, you know, some things I 
still agree with some things I probably wouldn't encourage people to to do as a solution. I mean, you know, breathing is nice, but yeah, no, I never recommend anyone substitute any of my articles for my website um, or any book for therapy. Yeah. Um. So yeah, so been dealing with that uh, my whole life. Uh, I share. I like to share my experience and use this platform I have to help people. Even people just hearing that someone else shares it is helpful on its own. But when I was researching you and I listened to Choice, it really resonated with me. And it was a simple message, sort of, that like just I absorbed differently, just the way that you kind of broke it down. And it kind of is opposite from the things that I've tried in the past. I mean, a lot of this stuff I feel like is paradoxical. And uh, just the trying to fix it part of it is, I think, as you would say, might be part of the problem. Right. So I feel like a lot of people are in my position. They're running around. They're trying different therapies, reading different books, um, taking medication, going to the jungle to throw up. <laughs> uh, you know, I've tried physical approaches like progressive muscle relaxation, deep breathing, um, you name it, you know, hypnosis, which I didn't know that you actually like hypnosis for certain things. Very few. But um, the reason I'm saying this is because your message that we'll get into is something that I want to I want to share that I feel I like can help people that's not just one of those things that I've tried that just came and went. You know, uh, a couple months ago when I first came here, I was just in a one of those times in my life where it was pretty bad. Like I couldn't even walk into a restaurant. I couldn't even go to my own family's house with feeling like very off. And, uh, you know, we've made some progress, I feel, and I can... I could do those things now um, and not alter my life, continue my life's path, because as we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that feelings aren't the goal. Um, so it's been successful, you know? Like, I, 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 I got to be careful. A lot of times he reprimands me about my vocabulary, but uh, I just, just want people I, to know that this is... I offer different perspectives. <laughs> yes, offer different perspectives that have helped <laughs> that I think can have a very beneficial influence. Beneficial influence. When yeah. we, He's uh, going to correct me a when lot. <laughs> we when we integrate them into kind of our process, both, yeah. both in terms of how we think about things, how we behave about things, you know, how we understand things. Yeah, because with me, like the older I got um, with anxiety and perfectionism and stuff like that, in this journey of like trying to fix it, I feel that, I was making choices that were exacerbating the problem uh, and making it like uh, treating it like it was life, like it was fragile. And, you know, I know you talk about like fragility and stuff and altering my life. You know, um, I would have trouble going on vacation because I'm worried that I'm not going to get enough sleep to party the next day, you know, um, and we'll talk about sleep, too, because that was another reason why I started here. But having really bad insomnia, um, living life like very rigidly and setting rules. And I stopped drinking coffee. I stopped drinking alcohol. You know, that's like the first thing that you when you look how to fix this stuff, someone will tell you, like, stop drinking coffee. You know, it's right. like whatever. Uh, Dr. Phillipson. Should I call you Steve? Or I like, prefer Steve, yeah. Steve is, you know, the first therapist that uh, told me to drink. No, I'm kidding. Actually, <laughs> in a certain context. Well, yeah. Well, let's, say, let's say I encouraged you yeah. to go back to living your natural life path. Right. Because when people become fragile about their anxieties and they engage in what you did, escape responses, mm -hmm. like leaving the stage or leaving the scene uh, or avoidance responses, like not going to certain restaurants or not going on vacation. We're not getting on a plane. So the more that we alter our life path for the service of our conditions, for our, our handicaps, uh, the more it actually substantiates and reinforces those conditions and exacerbates and worsens those conditions. Right. You know, we're, we're showing the brain that 
the challenges that it's presenting us are substantive and uh, legitimately problematic rather than showing the brain that its challenges can be uh, overridden by our you know, determination to not let our anxieties alter our life path. So yes, I encouraged you to continuing your relationship, which was adaptive. It wasn't a maladaptive relationship with, let's say, coffee or alcohol, mm -hmm. because that's just a natural part of the way you wanted to live your life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I felt that as much as I was trying to solve the problem and fix the problem, like I would another problem in life, like working on my body or in the gym or whatever, I'm like, this can't be a long-term solution. Life is going to be, it's going to have ebbs and flows and ups and downs. And there might be a, a vacation where I don't sleep or, you know, like I might want to drink for a couple days in a row. And even if it makes me feel like shit, you know, like that's how I used to live my life when I was like a careless kid, like in his twenties and stuff, you know, and again, whatever treatments and roads I was going down, we're getting away from that. And I feel like your stuff kind of brought me back to that, you know, where I could like take a nap if I'm tired. I don't have to say, oh my God, I can't take this nap right now because it's going to mess up my sleep pattern and I'm going to, you know, blah, 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 or, you know, wear sleep trackers and do all this like analytical stuff of the situation instead of like the stuff that I don't care about. I want to live life with this stuff the way I live it. The, uh, I want to look at it the way I look at other things. Like right now I'm not worried about like this, like ceiling caving in right now you know so i'm not gonna sit here and focus on it and do breathing exercises around it and <laughs> alter my life's path you would know? that be a thought your brain would ordinarily share with you the ceiling caving in on you or was that no just but that's what i mean like we're so picky and so we're selective about like what we choose to give relevance to and care about versus what we don't you know and like my i start to admire people that don't give relevance to this stuff the people that are just like you know, I, I, I uh, have a friend who's like a, a cycle instructor and she drinks till 5 a.m. sometimes and then goes and teaches three classes in a row because that's just the way, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. where, <clears throat> whereas I would have that's a, a lot of stamina. It is, but I would have like a, a problem doing that because my brain would probably tell me that I can't. And again, I'd. I admire someone like her who's just not giving relevance to those signals, you know. Maybe she doesn't even get those signals. She you know, doesn't. Her brain's probably focused on other aspects of her life, and she's just totally committed to living her authentic path and drinking heavily and then cycling. She doesn't do it every day, but, you know, she has. <laughs> you know, it's you know to me, uh, it's funny because as a scientist, uh, we don't use words like alcoholic because that implies a disease model with alcohol. Mm -hmm. We use terms like problem drinker or alcohol dependence. And so we look at things in a very functional way. You know, is her relationship with alcohol functional for her? And if it is, good for her. Right. Yeah. So now, you know, again, your the methods of the choice and what you kind of talk about just seem like a way of kind of living with this stuff and not altering your life path. And uh, I guess first let's, we'll just backtrack for a second when we were talking about just different forms of therapy and stuff like that. You know, what's out there, what's usually prescribed for OCD and stuff like that. And then as you were saying before, the, this, the difference between the different kinds of therapists Sure. So, so uh, it's it's still uh, surprising and, and uh, disappointing that people don't know the difference between a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or a psychotherapist. So mm -hmm. a psychiatrist is a medical doctor who is trained to prescribe medication. Um, they look at most psychiatric or psychological conditions as something that can be mediated through uh, medication. Um, tragically, in psychiatry, there is not a single medication that actually cures any psychological condition. Every medicine that people take for psychological conditions create, hopefully, a, a temporary fix or improvement. Um, 
but you remove the medicine and then the condition often returns, uh, which is it's kind of sad because in a medical model, if you have strep throat and you take you know, an antibiotic, there goes your strep throat. It's nice mm-hmm. and gone and doesn't come back. Uh, you know, in psychiatry, you take these medications for anxiety, let's say, like a, a Xanax or a Benzo, um, Clonopin, and, you know, in 30 minutes, you feel much less anxious, and that relief might last for a few hours, and then the anxiety can come back. There's nothing that's uh, corrected by the medicines. You just get a sort of a neurological subduing, and so... So, yeah, there's the psychiatrist who prescribe medicine. Psychologists is a very regulated term. Someone cannot call themselves a psychologist unless they have a license in psychology. Um, And so I am a clinical psychologist. You can get a license in clinical psychology, which works with people generally individually in therapy, or a school psychologist, which works in a school system. Um, There's community psychologists and then business psychologists, people who are hired to make profit or morale better in a company. And then this thing called psychotherapist. Now, that's a completely non-regulated term. Mm. Uh, and what that means is that with it across the country, anyone can call themselves a psychotherapist or even a therapist, um, and there's no regulation around there being a, a license behind that. Mm-hmm. So, um, And a lot of times that's what you see out there, I feel. You know, what, 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 I, what, more, I, what I saw a lot of. Yeah, more and more people are getting like master's degrees, which is a two-year degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me to get my PhD, I was in uh, graduate school for literally uh, six and a half years. Mm-hmm. Actually, seven and a half years. I got I have two master's degrees and then a PhD in psychology. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of time, uh, a lot of clinical work. Um, and a lot of money, <laughs> but, um, you know, it definitely, uh, was worthwhile. And then what, what about cognitive behavioral therapy? Right. Where does that fall? So into within, it? within psychology, unfortunately, um, although with time things are changing slowly, um, you know, there are different approaches to treating different conditions. So in actually my, my father was what was called a, a psychoanalyst, which is like a Freudian, mm. uh, you know, he would, ask people what their dreams are. He would have people lay down on the couch. I've done that one. Close your eyes, just talk. Yeah, just talk freely. Yeah. And then the therapist sits behind you and and analyzes, uh, you know, what you're saying and offers maybe insight into how you became the screwed up human that you are. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in the world of science, it doesn't really seem to suggest that developing insight into how did I become the, you know, messed up human being that I became, uh, that that insight to the road to becoming that doesn't really produce any benefit. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that's probably the most predominant uh, sort of uh, counter to cognitive behavioral work. Um, there are things like now what's called... Uh, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, a person by the name of Steve Hayes. And that shows, I think, a lot of promise. Uh, and it really coincides very well with kind of behavioral methods. So in the type of therapy that I uh, do, there's a lot of what's called like homework-based uh, intervention. Most of the therapy actually takes place in between the appointments. Mm-hmm. It doesn't actually take place within the appointment. So within the appointment for cognitive work or behavioral work, the outline of the in-between session uh, work is kind of developed and agreed upon. And then the patient each day will apply the principles that they've learned in the therapeutic environment and, you know, kind of apply them, you know, on a day-to-day basis toward their treatment goals. Mm -hmm. So in behavior therapy or cognitive behavior therapy, there are very de- there are very specific delineated, you know, kind of issues that are worked toward, and there's often like a finish line of what success looks like within cognitive behavioral work. Whereas yeah. when anal- with an analysis or what's called talk therapy, which is basically you come in 
just talk to the therapist about what's taken place in the prior week and the therapist might, you know, give ideas or suggestions, but there's no real kind of uh, treatment goal that's um, agreed upon. So do you think that, um, you know, because not everyone's walking around with OCD or anxiety, but they're still going to see a therapist. Sure. They might have marital issues, they might right. have whatever, right. work issues. Yeah, and, I, and I treat depression so, also. So the CBT, that approach, work for that stuff as well? Just general life? You know, because I've, I've sure. used it for as sort of like to undo a specific thing, I feel. Yeah. But yeah. what, but no, you know, I mean, can other CBT people... or behavior, behavior therapy uh, is excellent for treating anxiety disorders, sexual dysfunctions, um, sleep uh, disorders, uh, cognitive behavioral work. Sexual dysfunction, like? Sexual dysfunctions, like, like penis erectile, doesn't work. You know, there, there's penis and vagina. Vaginas uh, don't work too? I didn't know that. Occasionally, I've vaginas. Never met one that didn't. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, that's very, that you're a very skilled lover, exactly. apparently. Um, uh, you know, the penis challenges can be difficult to get an erection, difficulty maintaining an erection, difficulty achieving orgasm. Um, and vaginas sometimes malfunction in terms of, let's say, not getting lubricated mm. or even not being orgasmic. Um, or sometimes there's a condition where the walls of the vagina become very constricted. It's called vaginismus. And that's where uh, a woman would find it very painful to have any object inserted in her vagina. Mm. So CBT can behavioral help, uh, technology behavioral therapy works very, very well with, with sex therapy. And it's been, you know, that was in the seventies, really one of the, the big starts of behavioral work producing very, very consistent positive outcomes. So in behavior therapy and cognitive behavior therapy, we consider ourselves a, a data-based science where we can actually track, right. you apply these principles, patient engages in these treatment processes, and you, you achieve these outcomes. Mm -hmm. And then there's, um, we were talking, we can hit a little bit on hypnosis, which you hear that one. Very little. What we were, <laughs> very little time on hypnosis. Oh it's, yeah, it's such a such well. A, we I didn't know because of you know again you do the behavioral therapy. Right. I've a lot of people get try hypnosis. Um, you know you could probably Google like, and th ten thousand searches will come up about like cure whatever it is that yeah. you're dealing with with yeah. hypnosis right now. Right. Just yeah. Listen to this audio. No, I can say scientifically. I I taught hypnosis as I said at Hofstra for four years, so it did me a, a great service in learning what hypnosis is not appropriate for. Uh, mm. It's not appropriate for like um, weight loss. It's not appropriate for cigarette cessation. Those are all the ones you usually hear. That, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It, it but really, it can cure warts. It, well, I mean, yes. Uh, and when happen? I tell that to people. I said, I'm like, you have to save this for the podcast. <laughs> yeah, uh, when I tell that to people, and you can Google it, it's, it's well-researched that, Hypnosis is a very effective treatment for for uh, general warts. Yeah. How does that happen? Um, you give a post hypnotic suggestion uh, that blood flow will uh, be increased around the affected areas. I had one patient who had warts on his feet and warts on his hand. And when I when I told him that hypnosis can be an effective treatment for it, we ran our own little funny experiment where I first did hypnosis and I gave suggestions around his feet. And within two to three weeks, they completely cleared up. And then I gave him suggestions about the warts on his hands. Um, and they had remained, by the way. So when his feet warts cleared up, mm -hmm. his hand warts remained. And then after about two to three weeks, I gave him some more. I, and I give him a tape, by the way, to take home and to listen to the tape on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And then I gave him a, his suggestions related to the warts on his hands. And two to three weeks later, they cleared up. And I'm still so you think in it's contact. Like a, it's, like a, it's a blood flow thing? That the hypnosis blood is kind of... Um, you know, maybe white blood cells to the affected area, or there may be kind of a mental component. I have no idea why hypnosis yeah. is such a powerful tool to treat warts. But wow. anyway, You're so... You're so science-based that that would be like the last thing I'd expect you right, to say. You know? Right. Yeah, yeah. But it, um, I mean, in the world of science, you, you give these suggestions and you see the warts going away. So that's pretty scientific. Right, yeah. And Results. like I said, you can, you can go online and you can Google... I had since warts 50s, as a kid, actually. Yeah, since the 50s, <laughs> uh, warts has been removed by hypnosis. It's well I don't know documented. how mine went away. I think they just did. I didn't get them, like, frozen off or anything. I don't know. 
back then in Staten Island, some guy from the deli probably cut them off or something. <laughs> um, all right. So I think that we like set the table pretty well for what you do and how I got here. And Oh, let me just say, by the way, uh, in terms of uh, some of the elements in the Joyce article, the, the first part. Yeah, that's what like I was going to get into. People, people often ask me, uh, you know, can I help them? Mm-hmm. Um, and I find that, uh, I guess, a, a reasonable question, but it really doesn't even come to understand what I do. And I, and I always respond in the same way. I said that, you know, my role as a clinician is not to help anybody. Uh, what I do is I provide guidelines. I offer ideas. I say, you know, when a patient tells me about their condition, I draw a map of what's going on. And then I work on drawing a map in terms of a pathway to recovery and offering those ideas. I say I, I lay treatment on the table between right. us and each patient picks up those ideas and utilizes them and integrates them based on their own time and their own trust. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing that I think has in a very short period of time made our work, let's say, uh, productive for you is because you've come in here trusting and you know, very open to applying these principles and, you know, kind of seeing, you know, in a fairly time efficient way that aggressively applying these principles provides a really beautiful dividend. Yeah, for sure. You definitely have to do the homework, apply the principles to your real life and not expect to just come in here and get instantly cured or whatever. And for everyone that's listening, again, um, this isn't like, uh, I'm cured and now I'm talking to him about it. You know, it's, it's a ongoing thing, but I do like the tool of it all that I have now to apply to other things. Like we'll, we'll talk about like living on the crumbs, feelings aren't the goal, um, all those elements that we'll talk about. So, um, we don't have that much time. So let's talk about choice. We got a little time, actually. We have time, but <laughs> we can talk about this stuff all day. Like we've already uh, yeah, we talked sure. thirty minutes on warts. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> you know, so how would you kind of just summarize what choice is before, like, because again, it's really it's kind of long. Um, just so you guys know, like, I read it, and you know, uh, after working with Steve for a little bit, I was like, is this a book? People should read this. This should be available to people, you know, and that's kind of hope. Well, that's why it's online. That's why it's online. Hopefully that's why, you know, now that I started my podcast, I wanted to like get it out there like that. Again, I wouldn't share every other form of therapy that I've learned, <laughs> um, but this one is, it's a goodie. I feel like it's, it's cool. And it's, again, it's something that I feel like I've heard before in a way, um, but just not broken down the way that you right. kind of do. So how would yeah. you kind of like summarize it? Yeah, the reason that I wrote the article and called it choice is because people are so confused as to what we actually have choices to make in our world. Um, so one of the most important concepts uh, that I elaborate on is the differentiation between like our brain's voice and then what I refer to as the, the gatekeeper voice. Uh, Buddhists might refer to it as the monkey mind versus the wise mind. The lizard brain, I've heard that that's, one. That's another one. That would be more of the independent system of the, the brain voice. Mm-hmm. So, you know, an example of the brain voice is if I, uh, if I stub my toe, my brain might yell at me, you clumsy idiot, uh, just as almost a mental reflex. And there's sort of no Steve in that critical voice. Uh, I don't think, A, that I'm clumsy. I'm a fairly athletic person. And uh, although I'm an idiot in some areas of life, in general, you know, I'm... Idiot uh, savant. (laughs) My patients think that I'm an idiot savant, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, that my brain, like, why would my brain, just for stubbing my toe, you know, call me, you know, a clumsy idiot? Um, But... You know, I've got no control over that voice, and uh, nor is that voice this kind of deep, dark truth, deep, dark representation of my actual perspective. Mm-hmm. It's actually a uh, an association from the, the the brain that can speak to us, which I can then look at as a separate entity, as the gatekeeper, and say, "Hey, you know what? I don't really endorse that idea." 
um, you know, I'm not, I don't endorse that I'm clumsy and I don't endorse that I'm an idiot, but I certainly give my brain permission to kind of have that association. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the, the greatest causes of pain in, in most humans is they don't understand that our brains speak to us often in ways that are extremely critical, um, sometimes extremely demoralizing. Our brain makes uh, often a lot of predictions that are completely a fabrication of a broken crystal ball. Um, and that what's really important is that we as the gatekeeper in the world of mindfulness, which is the ability to be aware of what we're thinking and what we're observing in our brain voice, and that we can make choices in terms of what ideas we endorse and what ideas we can be very dismissive of. Mm -hmm. So the brain voice is not always this dark negative entity. Um, many comedians derive their sense of spontaneity from just kind of opening up to letting their brain, you know, connect comedy to like satire or um, irony um, and just kind of take their brain's information, check it as being funny according to their standard, and then kind of give voice to that. Mm -hmm. So the brain voice is an incredibly creative and spontaneous part of the machine between our ears called the brain. But within that, we exist separately as kind of an identity that looks at the brain voice and reacts to the brain voice and can make choices about the brain voice, but is not necessarily a victim of it. And the biggest takeaway that resonated with me is how it truly is its own independent system. Yeah. So can you talk about independent systems versus... Sure. Autonomous? Vers versus... Uh, the you know or or you know autonomous ability to yeah. make yeah I just a don't choice. think that people we're not just walking around fully conscious of how independent these systems are and how trying to not make relate to it as independent is like uh, and you have plenty of metaphors for that like my favorite one staring at your penis and saying. Give me an erection. Get, get hard now. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's truly, it's independent. <laughs> right. And you can't do that. Erections, you know? erections are independent. Uh, some and, things that we, some things we um, are, accept that are independent. And then some things, you know, like this voice in our head and stuff like that. We, we don't look at it as that. And yeah. uh, for me, you know, um, sometimes. We had some trouble, uh, struggles with sleep. Yeah. And, and that's probably one of the the biggest independent systems that businesses, you know, kind of offer billions and billions of dollars of products yeah, melatonin, to give people, you know, the sleep that they quote unquote need. Uh, and they're really conditioned to think of sleep as something that's needed right. uh, versus, you know, our, our brain chooses, you know, when sleep visits and our brain can wake us up. Uh, those are all within the machine. Uh, I wish that I could snap my fingers and, and get to sleep when I choose. Um, you know, I, I just set a stage where sleep might visit me. Um, and sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But oftentimes uh, when we put pressure on independent systems mm -hmm. to try to control them, it really blows up and exacerbates the problem. So right. people who go to bed and are desperate to get to sleep you know, it can stay up the entire night. Men who are desperate to have an erection because they want to impress the girl that they may be with, you know, are, are often going to have the exact opposite effect. Right. Having a headache and being desperate for relief can exacerbate the condition. There, there are many, many independent systems that, uh, and even thought, you know, is an independent yeah. system. Um, like I said, you know, stubbing my toe and my brain says as an independent system, you clumsy idiot. If I looked at that as a representation of my actual low self-esteem or my feelings about who I am as a person, then I would go around going back to the days when I actually had depression and had tremendous low self-esteem until I sort of discovered these principles. Well, people don't, well, I don't say people don't realize, but these independent systems and these thoughts and these feelings um, can be really debilitating. You know, 
for me, sometimes, you know, I get what uh, you would call anxiety on steroids, where you feel depersonalized, out of body. Yeah. You don't feel like yourself. You don't feel like you relate to the world around you. You start to get even depressed because of that. Um, well, you feel defective. Yes. You, know, you feel like, you know, your own brain is kind of ruining your life. Right. And, and like, you know, and that was really very perplexing to me in terms of like some, many of the themes of anxiety or OCD. It didn't make sense to me. Why would our own brain, an amazing machine that's designed to optimize our survival, mm -hmm. why would it generate these things that seem to be so self detrimental, you know, life detrimental? Um, you know, and I'm happy to say that I've had in my short time on this planet about four episodes of depersonalization, derealization. And I'm happy to say that because when patients talk about it, I definitely know what that is like. Right. Uh, now I look at it as a brainstorm. You know, it, you know, it's anxiety on steroids where we feel like we're not even on our own body. We're not living our own lives. We feel very alienated from the identity that we're used to kind of existing within. And it's very frightening. Many mm -hmm. people, and I, I also, um, you know, uh, was frightened by it because, um, unfortunately, my father uh, had a history of psychosis. And so I grew up uh, with this kind of a sort of Damocles over me, maybe, maybe I'm going to be next. Maybe, you know, I Which will would inherit be, What is psychosis? Schizophrenia. Yeah. It's a like, loss of reality testing. Okay. So um, he, he when thought, you hear the word psychotic break, psychosis. Yeah, it's a loss of reality. A person thinks that that radio is talking to them, uh -huh. you know, or a person thinks that they're a god um, or, or that they're, you know, some alien. Okay. Um, one of my patients has a, a girlfriend who, um, she had thoughts that the government, uh, is, had planted a, um, a listening device in her brain and the, the CIA is, is gleaning information, valuable yeah. information from her. That's like the whole group chat with the cast of Jersey Shore. <laughs> think that all the crazy stuff, but yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's a tragic condition. Um, yeah. you know, once again, there's no treatment for it. There's drugs that can subdue the brain, which are very unpleasant. But, um, so, you know, would you, it, would, would, would they go to therapy like, like this for yeah, that or no, cause no, that's just what, so you have to take antipsychotic it, medication. Basically. It's just so extreme. Yeah. It's, it's the brain is, thing. the brain is so broken in, in that condition. Uh -huh. But, uh, I mean, there are some medications that can, for many people with schizophrenia, you know, live somewhat of a normal life. But once again, you go off those medicines and these, you know, loss of reality testing thoughts kind of reemerge. Anyway, so, so DPDR, uh, you know, feels like you're going crazy and that really frightens the hell out of people. Right. Um, you know, it, it's not uncommon that people become ang anxious about getting anxious Yeah, because That's anxiety me. can be so bewildering and threatening. Yeah. Um, and, and so for DPDR, you know, the idea of I'll do anything to ha not have that happen again. Right. Whereas in my world, it's like, yeah, it was a storm. It lasted about an hour. You know, I, I actually had a, a DPDR experience with a patient, uh, in my office and she was kind of going on about her frustrating fiance. And, you know, I heard about 5% of what she was saying because I was trying to figure out whether I was going crazy and I should ask her to leave my office because it wouldn't be fair to have a patient see me have a psychotic break. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, I was like, hey, if this is just a panic attack, then it's better that she stay in the office not to escape from the anxiety. Mm -hmm. So I ended up choosing to see it as anxiety. She left after 45 minutes and, you know, I put my head on my desk. I cried a little bit because it was so intimidating and overwhelming. And I was like, hey, I'm still here. I guess that was just anxiety. All right. Yeah, and I think that um, you can substitute DPDR for maybe the OCD thoughts or whatever independent system is just occurring and then use the principles of choice to sort of navigate through them. Yeah. And so I don't want people to think that, oh, like, you know, this is only going to work for this or for that or whatever. It's kind of just like, um, for me, it was a lot of that. And then, like you said, uh, you know, one of the biggest things you want to hear 
when you're having like heart palpitations, for example, is that you're not having a heart attack. Right. When you're having DPDR, you want to hear that you're not going crazy. Right. You know, so you lost your mind. Uh, a lot of it is your brain now being obsessed and checking in over and over again. If you're okay, why do you feel like this? Yeah. And you know, how bad goes, is it going to get? Right. When and will the, and, it end? And the reason why when the other get, when can I get me back? Right. So that desperation of trying to fix it, and you know, this is where I think people start to go wrong is to try to fix it, look for mechanisms to fix it, try to breathe their way out of it, try to alter their life's path, stop drinking, stop doing things like that, which I thought was the right thing to do. You know, uh, I don't know what I would actually be curious because I know a lot of my family gets heart palpitations, like what you would kind of say to that. But uh, I have I have a feeling I might know, but uh, yeah, it's its own independent system. Right. And uh, you have to just continue your life's path and yeah. treat it like it's irrelevant. Exactly. I just want to mention before we go to your family's heart palpitations, you know, DPDR in an, in an extended uh, system becomes what's called ASC, which stands for Altered States of Consciousness. Yeah. And people often get that even following a bad trip with marijuana mm -hmm. uh, or uh, mushrooms um, or even LSD, where they feel like this experience has altered their identity sort of forever, and, and they, they feel different again. They always are aware that they're not living the experience that they used to live mm -hmm. and their brain keeps circling back and pointing out the ways, the contrast and what they feel versus how they used to feel. Right. And so I call that kind of chasing the dragon of trying to get back to my good old self. Mm -hmm. And the more desperate you are to establish that you've recreated your identity. Once again, the paradox, as you said beautifully before that, it, it distances you from the goal rather than brings you closer to the goal. And the same thing is said for the OCD type of thoughts that I don't personally get, but I read about them in, in your work. But, you know, what are the types of thoughts and things that people get when they have, what do they call it, uh, traditional OCD or? Uh... Well, there's there's sort of three main subsets of OCD. It can be a very complicated and confusing condition. That's why I really encourage people, if you have OCD especially, make sure you go to an expert because mm -hmm. it's it's so intricate in the way that it presents itself and so diverse. So the, the, the most common form of OCD is like contamination OCD, right. uh, where people are afraid most often of like getting sick, getting AIDS from a doorknob. That's the most common in the, uh, in the late 80s, uh, you know, uh, maybe there's someone who bled on the doorknob and the blood got into my hands and, you know, I caught AIDS that way. Uh, you know, public toilet seats, doorknobs, light switches, door handles. You know, the idea that certain surfaces present a kind of a, a sickness risk. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another form of contamination OCD where the person doesn't give a damn about the sickness but they're more focused on the awareness of dirty and not dirty. It's like it's icky there or not icky there, gross, not gross. And so people engage in cleaning rituals, not for the sake of preserving health, but for the sake of like maintaining their world in an environment of cleanliness mm -hmm. because things sort of should be clean. And what's interesting is that for people who have the cleanliness OCD for the idea of right and wrong versus sick or not sick, these people most often come with a second diagnosis, which represents a personality style called, I hate the name, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. I call it perfectionism. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a pervasive personality style of where people, you know, live in a world of shoulds, right, wrong. And so these people like things should be clean. I shouldn't be aware of dirtiness on my hand or, mm -hmm. you know, things on my desk or my phone, you know, should be maintained in a, in a proper order. So, um, so you've got the contamination OCD and then also the behavioral ritualizers or the overtly behavioral ritualizers, people who check light switches, yeah. people who check the stove. Um, I had a patient once in the uh, 80s uh, who had OCD about fire. And so no matter how many times she would check the stove, 
when she would walk away, her brain would say, maybe you bumped into the knob on your way out of the kitchen and mm -hmm. you turned, on, turned it on. So when she would go to work, she would call her home answering machine. That just shows you how long ago this was. Because mm -hmm. we used to have these answering machines in the 80s. I'm sure there's one of them in here somewhere. Oh, you're very funny. <laughs> very funny. <laughs> you just get one as an artifact, you know, just to paint the picture. I should have like uh, one of those phones that you hold it here. Yes, and it was... <laughs> that's all it's missing in here. <laughs> so anyway, so she would call her home. And when the answering machine would pick up, that would tell her that her apartment hadn't burned, burned down, down in the yeah. fire. So anyway, so these are observable ritualizers, meaning that the ritual of hand washing or using like cleansers, like when Purell came out, I was just like, oh my God, this industry is going to completely capitalize on the condition. So, so what's happening in the brain between, well, not between, but with the thought and then the behavior, the okay. ritualizing so that let you me, see people Let me do. talk about the three components oh, and then I'll get okay. into that. No problem. So the uh, so that's the behavioral observable ritualizers. Then there's another group of people who get anxious about not only not their own safety but the safety of others. So if I touched my shoe, uh, and then my brain says, "Oh, there's like New York City dirt on it," which obviously New York City dirt is the worst dirt in the world. Mm -hmm. um, I I could I could do anything with my oh, hands. Jersey Shore dirt's a little uh, <laughs> little little ratchet. Watch it! I grew up in Jersey Shore. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but I wouldn't want to shake your hand because I don't want to be responsible for giving you, mm -hmm. you know, sickness. Or these people might get anxious about maybe I said something that was offensive to you. And they would ruminate in their mind to make sure that they haven't, you know, sort of injured others um, or even their own children. So their concern is the safety of those around them rather than sort of trying to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And what makes this form of OCD particularly difficult to treat is because the condition comes not only with anxiety, but guilt. The, I, now the, the condition says, if I'm responsible for making you sick by touching you with my city shoe hand, then I'm a bad person. Mm -hmm. And so the condition goes into this thing called like character indictment, where not only is it, would I, you know, feel guilty for making you sick or possibly injuring you, but I'm also now going to condemn myself as being a bad person. Mm -hmm. And the form of OCD that I'm most known for and that I coined the term pure O standing for purely obsessional, mm -hmm. uh, which got me in a lot of trouble with a lot of scientists because OCD always has two components to it. There's a, an intrusive thought or an obsession, and then there's an undoing response. So when I first started writing, everyone knew about the hand washing, but nobody knew that there's another form of ritualizing, which is mental ritualizing, mm -hmm. to try to get rid of the anxiety through a thinking process. Mm -hmm. And so not only is the intrusive thought an obsession, but the undoing response is obsessional, meaning it's a thought process. And so when people hear Pureau, they think I'm just saying that there's just an intrusive thought and there's not an exit strategy, which is, you know, just a misunderstanding of the term. But so for the pure O form of OCD, I might have a thought, oh, I hate God. Mm -hmm. And then I might get very anxious about the brain sending me that thought, by the way. So it isn't even Steve thought, but the brain might say, you know, you hate God. And then I need to now undo that thought. Maybe I'm going to pray, pray to, you know, let God know, uh, you know, I don't mean it, I don't mean it, I don't mean it, please don't send me to hell. Mm -hmm. I might have an intrusive thought about harming my child. And then, you know, I might think, you know, oh, is that possible? And I might look back on like, oh, I, I'm not really someone who hurts people, so this isn't likely. And so once again, there's tremendous anguish and agonizing and mental distraction. Wait, what would be the trying to undo that one? That someone for me do. to you know think back on like have I ever hurt people uh -huh. is it my am I a violent person so sort of just engaging engaging with it, it, mentally it mentally right trying to undo or escape the threat that yeah. I might be a harm to my child that I might hate God okay um, looking for an escape that's right mentally that's right. yeah so uh, people with Puro typically have thoughts that are like sexually inappropriate mm -hmm. oh maybe I'm attracted to that child. People have thoughts about being attracted to the same sex. Oh, my God, I, I, you're looking really good today, by the way, Vinny. Maybe that means I'm gay. And now I'm getting anxious. Hey, now. Right? <laughs> that being gay. Like in the 80s when I treated this form of OCD, it was like 
I don't want to be gay because gay is bad. And I'm very happy to say that in the 90s and beyond, it's not so much I don't want to be gay because that would be bad. It's I need to know if I'm gay or not. So right. just the idea of yeah. having the uncertainty, am I gay or not gay, creates a lot of anxiety and a person will engage in a lot of mental ruminating or like looking at you, yes, I'm getting a little aroused, and then looking at some hot chick mm -hmm. and being like, oh my God, I'm not getting aroused, that must mean I'm gay. Right. So there's a lot of this mental you know, checking and mental undoing to try to like prove, you know, and gain, get an answer. And what about the, so, okay, so what about the physical ritualization like you hear about with contamination and why are people flip, flipping light switches? Like are those, those are esca uh, escape, escape methods, responses. Yes. escape responses? That's right, that's right. So what OCD and And then how does, like, what, and, then, and then anxiety, because yeah. I know that that's somehow feeding into the amygdala and the fight or flight of it all. Right. So how are they all kind of connected? Right. So to explain what the amygdala is, so the brain, the machine, is an incredibly multifaceted, uh, you know, kind of piece of biology. It's it's amazing. We still only know probably about 10% of it. It's kind of like a universe that's been very unexplored still. But we're pretty confident that there's this little thing at the base of our brain, kind of the reptilian brain, as you mentioned before, called the amygdala. And if the amygdala has an imbalance, it sends a signal called the fight or flight response. So when we were cavemen, if we go into a new cave and we're not familiar with it and it's pretty dark, we've got our little clubs in our hand and we hear a crackle on the, on the ground. We look at each other because we're like, is it a bear that's about to eat us or is it a deer that we could eat? Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's called the fight or flight response. Let's run the hell out of here if it's a bear or let's go, you know, kill the deer and get some food for our family. Or maybe play dead. <laughs> Which is that? No, is that the, is that the freeze response? Uh, well, that might be a freeze response because uh, I think that if, that's if a we're big startled. One. We might we might freeze. Yeah, freezing happens mostly with being kind of startled. Mm -hmm. If we if we hear a crackle, then our our brains are going to kind of look at like how much danger are we in, mm -hmm. and and what should we do to extricate ourselves from the danger, or you know investigate. But anyway, so so the amygdala is designed in that movement of cavemen to prepare us physiologically for this emergency. Mm -hmm. And as modern people, if our amygdala has an imbalance, we feel the terror of a crisis. We feel like there's a crisis. And there's no just kidding about it. We're feeling like we're about to be bitten by yeah. a rattlesnake. Doesn't matter how much money you have, how good looking you are. I mean, if that was the case, you'd never get I would be <laughs> chilling. <laughs> but. So we're feeling this crisis. Now, the brain doesn't like to think or feel that we're in a crisis and not know what's the cause. Mm -hmm. And so the thinking brain attaches these really stupid ideas to the crisis brain. Like catching AIDS from a doorknob is really stupid. Mm -hmm. Or a parent thinking maybe I'm going to harm my own child, is really stupid. These parents are not going to harm their own children, and we're not going to catch AIDS from a doorknob. Um, and I don't think God minds if the brain says, I hate you. You know, the God, if there is one who made the brain, knows that the brain is an independent system with these voices. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that these ideas are infused in the terror signal. And all of a sudden, us intelligent humans are behaving, you know, in a very primitive, desperate way on very, very stupid topics to try to extricate ourselves from the crisis signal. Mm -hmm. Even though most people with OCD are very rational, very intelligent, and they recognize that there's something very, you know, kind of irrational happening, but they're just so overwhelmed by the authenticity of the feelings. I hear patients say, 10 times a day, but it feels so real. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where you have to go back to where the choice article speaks about, you know, like feelings are not the goal mm -hmm. because the goal of managing these broken feelings is to show the brain that we're not going to be manipulated by its signals. And we can do that in a great variety of ways. So do you think that the, the thought comes first or this broken amygdala sort of happens and then attaches a thought to the broken amygdala? Right. Or are you, you know, saying, getting this thought like, I'm going to harm my child, and now you're having 
the amygdala starts to malfunction. Yeah. I think it really goes both ways. I think it's the chicken and the egg. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, uh, I've had patients say, um, you know, they're living this non-OCD life, and then uh, someone says to them, um, you know, oh, I thought you were gay. And all of a sudden, this brain explosion happens mm-hmm. of terror that, oh, my God, you mean you think I'm gay or maybe that means I am gay? Or, uh, you know, they'll they'll read a newspaper article of a parent that harmed their own children. And all of a sudden, boom, their brain blows up with this idea, maybe I could do that. Mm-hmm. And then the amygdala is misfiring, you know, with this, you know, question and uncertainty of their, their risk. So it really, I think, goes both ways. And then I just, I asked, I don't know if we answered it, but again, like uh, flipping a light switch 10, 20 times or whatever, like what is that? Right. So the amygdala is malfunctioning. It's sending a signal of terror. Like, you know, I need to make sure the light is off. Otherwise, maybe there'll be a fire. And so a person will... So that's related to like somehow like a fire one or something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, You know, that if you leave a light on, uh, you know, that could cause a fire. Uh Uh-huh. Um, I had one patient, one of my sort of funny stories, he used to use a flashlight to make sure the light was off. If you think about it, it's pretty funny. He used to use a flashlight. I don't In know other that. words, because the light oh, was off. Right. And he, the room was dark, so he needed a flashlight to, to make see. sure the light was yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> but well, uh, so, yeah. so the, 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 the answer to your question is a person often engages in a ritual until they feel better. They're, mm-hmm. they're behaving in a ritualistic way to try to neutralize the amygdala's energy. Uh-huh. And once again, paradoxically, often what happens is engaging in ritualizing actually sparks the brain to think, well, if you're engaging in such desperate behavior to put out this fire, mm-hmm. that must mean there is a fire. Whatever you just said right there is also, I feel like, the main summary of like this entire podcast and just the message. Yep. You know, um, that applies to like so many things, but sorry. Yeah. But going, can you repeat it? You said, oh, it was so beautiful. Oh, thank we, you. we have it on camera. <laughs> do, you have, do you remember it or no? Yeah. I, I said that when we substantiate the amygdala's message, right? Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I touched my shoe. Oh my God, this is city dirt. I need to go wash my hands because I'm now feeling very anxious. So I'm at the sink washing my hands to try to eliminate the distress signal. Because right. my brain told me that I'm feeling anxious because of the dirt, which is a lie. It's I'm feeling anxious because the amygdala is malfunctioning. Mm-hmm. So I'm at the sink, and while I'm washing to get rid of the threat, I'm saying to my brain, the threat is real. Look at me trying to escape from it. Mm-hmm. And that actually reinforces the condition to perpetuate and expand. If people have had OCD for years, it's often become extremely debilitating. Mm -hmm. People's lives with OCD can become extremely impaired and limited and handicapped. Yeah, and I think for someone maybe with like an anxiety disorder or whatever, the way that I relate to this stuff is, I don't know if you would call this escape. Well, yeah, I mean, escaping or ritualizing, but finding the different techniques to get out of it, which would be, you know, to alter my life's path, not get on that flight, um, go to a safe space. Go to a safe like space. Like when you were on in front of cameras and you used to be like, hey, guys, I'm not feeling okay. I'm going to leave. Yeah. Which was the worst thing to do. Right. Uh, but, you know, look, you're, you're, you're acting in an uneducated, un, uneducated way because you don't know what's happening. Right. And you don't know by leaving, you're reinforcing your broken brain signal that saying to you something is wrong you shouldn't be in this fragile state, this fragile place. So I know you're big on like, you know, a lot of people probably relate to that weathering the storm, which staying in the storm could be really challenging. Yeah. So is that, is that like exposure therapy? Because sometimes uh, you can kind of be in the storm a little bit with a little bit of exposure and kind of tiptoe out of it. But what about when you're just in it and you want to escape so bad? Uh, You know, is there any storm that's big enough for you to say leave it because it feels like it can feel completely debilitating scary especially when you're feeling depersonalized and stuff like that so 
I'm not sure of the nature of your question. I, I you know, I had a, a kidney stone, and uh, that was a level nine pain that I was begging strangers on the Long Island Railroad for aspirin. Mm-hmm. So that was a physical storm mm-hmm. that I chose to not bear with that level of, you know, excruciating pain. In terms of emotional storm, um, you know, I've had about 37 panic attacks in my life. Uh, my early ones were always, I'm going crazy like my father had, so I need to make sure that I, I'm i not actually having a psychotic break. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after age 40, it turns out that if you haven't had a psychotic break by age 40, you're more likely to get hit by lightning twice than to have one. So I passed this age line. I was like, yippee, I'm not going to go crazy. And then, of course, my next panic attack was I'm dying of a heart attack. Mm-hmm. And my brain was like, you idiot, go to the emergency room, get checked out by an emergency tech, you know, specialist, make sure you're not dying. But in, in any of those cases, I never um, gave in to the temptation, although with that patient, I came very close because I'd never had a DPDR experience before yeah. to really be out of my own body. But so, I mean, I would, I would always encourage someone to try to bear with the excruciating discomfort and, and terror of anxiety. Sometimes I I would say to someone who, let's say, has a losing history of escaping, you know, I would say, you know, okay, so maybe have a Xanax in Mm -hmm. your pocket as a, you know, it used to be called the pink parachute. You know, if you're really overwhelmed, if you decide to put up a white flag, you know, rather than going home or leaving the party Mm -hmm. or not going to work, uh, take a Xanax and, and get a little bit of that relief or even knowing that the Xanax is in your pocket, if you are very tempted to, you know, put up the white flag and say, I'm not willing to deal with this distress. So that's kind of that's kind of how I look and at like it. And like maybe use deep breathing exercises and stuff like that to reset yourself and but that can not, be helpful, not sure. as a not as, as an a escape, cure but as sort escape. of taking the edge off. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's just like, you know, sometimes when you just feel depressed or just off you know, like, uh, it's easier for me sometimes to weather a storm of an extreme anxiety, like a panic attack, than just feeling off in general. Because mm-hmm. it's kind of like, all right, the anxiety attack I know is going to come and go, but just feeling off, I don't know, you know, which now when we can get to what you're supposed to choose to do, um, I would approach it a little bit differently, like right. how I've been approaching right. it. Um yeah, so you know, the the, the I'm really uh, a big fan of the brain, even though it shares many many dark associations with me. My I have a very dark, very irreverent brain, um, and a very funny brain. Um, my brain often sends me jokes, not always at very appropriate times. Uh-huh. Um, me too. I usually say them. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I well, gotta be careful with that. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But the brain is 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 a is designed as a as a self-correcting mechanism. Mm-hmm. You know, we fall down, we get a boo-boo, and and sure enough, over time, it goes away. You know, right. our body is designed for self-healing, and the brain is designed for self-correcting. So, you know, I woke up early this morning, um, maybe thinking about this interview, because uh, you kept saying your last podcast got a million views, and my brain was just like. Well, oh. the, the clip did. Uh, I, w- I wish the full podcast did, but we're, this one will. Okay. We're, I'm putting it out there. It's going to get a million <laughs> views. But, uh, so, you know, my brain, you know, kind of woke me up, independent system at 5 a.m. Mm-hmm. and was saying, you know, oh, what are you going to say? And, you know, make sure you come across well. All kind of brain. Doing a great job. Brain nonsense. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, so, you know, my I was just like, oh, no, maybe I'm going to be you know, feeling off because I'm going to be tired. Mm -hmm. And so my response to that is, hey, variability, you know, I I allow for variability. And tonight my brain might self-correct and give me more REM sleep. And maybe by Tuesday I'll, you know, be good old sleep again. I actually feel totally fine right now. Not that I care about feelings, Mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, my fatigue is not having any impact. And even if it did, I would just make room for that variability. Mm Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so that's what's happening with the automatic systems when it comes to different anxiety. Independent systems. I'm sorry, independent systems. When it comes to anxiety, OCD thoughts. Even depression. Depression, yeah. Yeah, depression can be an independent system. You know, we have 
the brain has a lot of variability to it. It's not a perfect functioning machine. Mm -hmm. And so there's a difference between feeling depressed and being depressed. Which we is? Can, we can feel, we, like, we can feel uh, blue. We can feel lethargic. We can feel down. And that's very different than seeing ourselves in a negative light, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of seeing ourselves as being like a loser or evil or inferior, uh, you know, carrying around that sense of inadequacy and uh, inferiority uh, can be extremely depressing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, you know. But is that an amygdala thing? What's, no. ha what's happening with No, so depression? amygdala is anxiety. Okay, so. Depression is, is more of a, a perspective. When, when we endorse the dark brain voice, uh, you know, speaking very negatively to us and, and, and as the gatekeeper endorsing these negative ideas. So, you know, people who, you know, carry with them, you know, a tremendous sense of their own inadequacy, their inferiority, you know, uh, you know, their sense of being uh, a failure, you know, and the brain is, uh, you know, a very kind of harsh judge and often, you know, makes these conclusions about ourselves that are very dark, very negative. Uh, you know, Buddha said, uh, you know, life is suffering. Mm -hmm. And a very famous uh, American poet named Thoreau said, humans live lives of quiet desperation, mm -hmm. meaning that, you know, within our own secret, you know, kind of thinking process, most humans carry around a tremendous amount of self-hatred, and sense of inadequacy, and that produces for most people, you know, kind of a low-lying depression or low-level depression, which is a, a, a result of a cognitive, irrational thinking, cognitive, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of uh, uh, uneasiness or, or cognitive distortions, we call it as psychologists. And that causes like an emotional feeling That's inside right. you, which right. is the one that feels debilitating. That's right. You know, yeah. a lot well, of times, like just the thought alone, it has to be paired up with this like emotional feeling that really gets you down yeah. and debilitates you. Yeah. And it often does. I mean, a person who hates themselves, uh, you know, is going to carry a tremendously chronic sense of negativity and, and often blueness about them. All right. So that's an independent system as well. Um, you know, we're breaking things down, but as I started working with you, I don't part of my whole response isn't breaking everything down so technically. It's just like these are brain signals and then the way I, the gatekeeper, now reacts to those right. signals. I think how you that's, understand them, how you manage them. Right. That's where I feel like I've always known like the first part, fight or flight, what what was happening, but not the actual response that like I'm, I have to choose to, to make to them. Um, so... I guess uh, what really helped me, one of the ones that, because I know that there's a couple different approaches and strategies of how you react to the brain voice um, to convey irrelevance. Yeah. So should we talk about irrelevance first? Sure, sure. So um, a patient might say, you know, oh, I woke up feeling anxious this morning mm -hmm. um, as if that's a bad thing. And I'll often say, okay, well, what's the problem with that? Mm -hmm. And they're like, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, okay, I, I know anxiety doesn't feel good, but if you now change your life path mm -hmm. because of that anxiety, if you avoid going to work, if you uh, engage in a ritual, um, if you are desperate to feel better, then you're showing relevance to the malfunctioning signal, the malfunctioning independent system. Mm -hmm. uh, so... That, as we said, that perpetuates the condition, you know, kind of, uh, it's, you know, it's longevity. It's, it's, it'll last longer by giving anxiety or depression relevance. Right. Um, but the antidote uh, often is the conveyance of irrelevance and how do we do that? So one really important thing is to say, hey, I'm going to, I'm feeling anxious. I'm going to, you know, do my morning routine. I'm going to, you know, go to work and, uh, you know, I'm going to perform with whatever little bits of me are available. Mm. 
because I'm going to show my brain. We can't tell the brain, hey, this anxiety is meaningless mm -hmm. because the brain is sending such a powerful signal that makes it feel like you're having a crisis. But we can show the brain that the signal is irrelevant by, uh, number one, permission giving. Hey, anxiety comes and goes. I've been there, done that. I've been here before. I know what this is like. It, it, it lasts and it ends. So brain, you do what you need to do. Like this is, I often say, this is not my department. Mm -hmm. Feeling anxious, it's not my department. Having a headache, it's not my department. Mm -hmm. So number one is permission giving. And number two is the conveyance that nothing has changed as a result of the signal. Mm -hmm. So be able to say to your brain, feeling anxious or not feeling anxious, life's going to be the same. I'm not doing anything differently. So whether you bring it on, whether it lasts, whether it intensifies, none of those things are going to bring about a difference in my life path mm. is a huge way to convey irrelevance. And once we really show the brain that the signal is not a problem, that then allows the brain to engage in its self-corrective mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that Steve just said was using the little bits of you that you have available, which was living on the crumbs yeah. part of choice. Oh, or yeah. is that okay? Definitely. Cause I know you talked about it in your other podcast too. Um, so for me, living on the crumbs has helped immensely in terms of just, so what does that mean for you? How do you, how do you demonstrate that you're willing to live on the crumbs? What, how, how about share some situations that come up? So, um, living on the crumbs on its own would be whatever scenario that I'm in at the time. Um, it may not be perfect. I might not be like my fully best self. I might be, if I'm going for a run, for example, I might be dealing with like an injury. Maybe I didn't sleep well the night before, but I'm not going to be completely out. There's going to be some part of me that can still function, that can still walk and run, you know, actually it's a lot more than I think. It's just, my brain is telling me that, like, like you didn't sleep, so you're not going to be able to run at all. You know right. what I mean? So that, that's the actual, that's what it is to me. But where I find it more, more most beneficial is because a lot of my shit is just happens in the mind, but way before the run or the, the, the thing even happens that I'm about to go to, it's being able to send a signal back to my brain that sort of like chills it out a little bit of. Well, I would cautious you to say that it chills it out because that mm -hmm. implies a control. Okay. So to say that it, it allows for the brain to chill itself out. Okay. Because you're not being desperate to, to possess 100% Vinny. Perfect. Because what, the way I'm responding to signals now about the future is what you just said, first of all, the signal itself is not my department. Um, I can't control it. It's the brain voice. It's independent. Um, and I'm going to continue my life's path. Feelings aren't the goal. I'm not doing it so that I, I feel great. You know, I'm just going to just going to do it and monitor how you're feeling. Monitor how I'm feeling. Like, am I feeling better now? Am I feeling? Better oh, I'm not going to do that. Right, you're not. Right. Gonna, yeah, I'm not exactly, going to do that. Not yeah. Monitor how you're feeling. Um, and I'm going to live off the crumbs. And I think for someone who's like a perfectionist, everything has to be a hundred percent. Right. You know. So now I I think of things differently. Like uh, I might not be a hundred percent. I might use whatever I can. I'm going to live off of the of of the crumbs, and that gets me to do what I need to do because I'm no longer approaching the situation where it has to be perfect or it has to be anything near perfect. I'm just like, uh, you know, and living off the crumbs could be a lot of, it, it could be, like I said, it could, when you're going for a run, it could, it could be just however my body's feeling that day, or it could be a mental state as well. You know, you've said that to me as well. You know, if I'm feeling like when I go to my aunt's house next Tuesday, I'm going to feel mentally off and depersonalized. And it's like, the crumbs over there wouldn't be like, oh, my body's going to feel, it's not going to be a, a my body thing. It's going to be like, well, living off the crumbs might just be like, I'll still be there. I might not be fully be myself, but I'll use what I got to adapt to the situation. Is that, 
Yeah. Correct. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's how and, I've used it. And I would say, you know, that you'll offer whatever ideas occur to you, even if they're down 80%, you're going to you're going to be present, you'll participate with whatever level of mental creativity visits you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you won't you won't demand it, you won't force it. Um, you know, you'll just kind of unpack what shows up and and allow for it to show up on its own. Yeah. And for some reason, again, that that allows me to continue on my life's path and keep getting into the situations. You know, it's it's because because I, I know that the crumbs are there for me to live off of. Yeah. You know, I can't guarantee it's going to be great or no. or perfect, but I know that I'll be able to live off of like some right. kind of, and and. Again, well, I want to get into sleep as its own separate thing, but that's a big part of insomnia is fearing the yeah. next day. Yeah. And you're not going to be all there. And, right. you know, when you're laying in bed, tossing and turning at three in the morning. And your like, brain is saying, you're effed tomorrow. You're effed. How are you going to do this meeting? How are you going to do, how are you going to run this marathon or whatever it is? Um, you know, it's funny. I just watched this movie um, called Society of the Snow. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. The second version of the kids who ate each other. Yeah. On the mountain. On the mountain. And, uh, you know, they survived for like 72 days in insane conditions. Um, I'm pretty sure that they didn't get like great sleep, you know, <laughs> but they were living on the crumbs they were living, and they were living, on, living on, 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 human on, on human flesh and, yeah. and organs yeah. and stuff, you know, to, to get through. Um, so, so yeah, so, you know. Doing that, I think, is a is a good a good way of looking a perspective of having of uh, of anything that you're dealing with. You know, it's just like I, I was sick the other day and I had a cold and I felt uh, dealing with like a bulge disc. You know, and I'm just like, like as you would say, trying not to give myself a headache about having a headache. Yeah. Instead of just being like it's out of my control, I'm going to use what I got and just keep moving forward. You yeah. know, and a, a big thing is like. Um, one thing I kept repeating, I keep repeating to myself is you're not doing this to immediately feel better. Right. Just as you do this, you're showing the brain over and over again that it's irrelevant. Yeah. Right. And that's where we get into yeah. feelings aren't the goal. The, this treatment is a very process oriented treatment rather than a goal oriented treatment. Mm-hmm. Although as behaviorists, we pride ourselves in setting goals. So we can measure, you know, let's say you're a performer and you have stage fright. Um, you know, we can measure getting in front of an audience, the degree to which a person's heart is no longer pounding or they're no longer putting a pressure to achieve a goal of being approved of or found funny or found, you know, to have done a successful job. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, to focus more on one's own inner faith in the process. And what happens is by giving the audience permission to judging that person negatively, Mm -hmm. that allows them to connect more with their natural skills and resources, faith in default is what I call it, rather than each moment demanding achieving a goal. Right, because we would be obsessed with them judging us and failing but would you, would you just say giving them permission to to judge us? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> giving them permission to be judged negatively. Right. Um, you know, if a comedian uh, tells a joke, I mean, what percentage of the audience is going to laugh for them to think, oh, that was a successful joke? My percentage is probably like 1%, zero. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, hey, if out. you found it funny, that's all that counts, right? Yeah. And, and actually, I think that's a very important part of managing some uh, performance anxiety is satisfying our own process rather than looking into the audience to, to validate, you know, whether it was funny, whether I'm desirable, yeah. you know, to, to really have our own inner map of what our goals are interpersonally or professionally or process wise, like with, with Ant so-and-so mm-hmm. in Staten Island. Yeah, I mean, permission giving is like everything. You know, and that's where I think we also go the other way is we're trying to escape these uncomfortable feelings and uncomfortable thoughts and stuff. But, you know, another thing is just allowing it to be there. Um, what I learned also in a non-resentful way, 
Because you didn't that that article didn't come out yet, right? No, no. Okay. We you got, can, we got you no, can mention facets of it. That's fine. Yeah, we got another banger coming out uh, <laughs> about about resentment Thanks. and Thanks. Uh, because yeah, you do resent it. You know, you yeah, we resent our brain yeah. uh, for malfunctioning, and that makes things worse. Mm -hmm. uh, we might resent others for not approving of us, and that doesn't help anything. Uh, so it, that's a huge component of you know, you know, living a, a more peaceful life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in terms of choice and the article, do you think that we kind of got the gist of it, hit on independent systems, yeah, so one living thing, on the crumbs? Yeah, well, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, and I think probably in the top five important words in our vocabulary, is, is the word human uh -huh. and, and how people define human. I think that people have such such a misunderstanding of what it means to be human. Uh, so once again, you know, where Buddha says life is suffering, I used the phrase in the Choice article that, you know, humans live in the mud hole. We're, we're all dirty. We're, we're all imperfect. We all make mistakes. Mm -hmm. We all have moments of weakness. And, you know, um, I look at it and we're all crazy. Mm -hmm. We're all crazy in a multitude of ways. Uh, I sort of almost have a game as a psychologist when I meet someone new, how quickly can I diagnose them? Mm -hmm. um, and it usually doesn't take too long. Uh, but diagnosing people is sort of one of my specialties. But the thing is, is, you know, I have my own diagnoses. And humans think mostly in terms of kind of relative status, you know, who's better than who. People yep. often think in these these large terms of like, you know, is that person cooler than me? Is that person more successful than me? Um, and to me, human is an equalizer. Mm -hmm. uh, I tell people, you know, you're as crazy as I am, and that's really bad news for you because I'm really crazy. <laughs> uh, but I really have a lot of peace in my own belief of the equality of the human condition. So I never think, oh, like, am I crazier than you or am I, am I less successful? Um, because as humans, to me, we're all equal in the mm -hmm. grand picture. You know, you're a, you know, a better actor than I am, a better comedian than I am, perhaps, um, I and I'm probably a better sailor than you are. Uh. Uh, so I, we can compare specific aspects of our life, right. but in the grand aggregate of one person compared to another, I never engage in that. I never encourage anyone to engage in that. Most people don't agree with me. Most people think some people's lives are easier than others. Some people have more privilege than others. Mm -hmm. To me, if you're human, I just know that there's a lot of suffering, a lot of challenges, a lot of moments of weakness. And I just look at it like, you know, we're all, we're all sort of in the same shoes. That was extremely helpful to me when I was reading about resentment because when you're going through something, it's easy to like all you all you're doing is comparing yourself to everybody else, especially with social media. Yeah, you're looking at Instagram. You're looking at Instagram. Everybody's having looks so happy. Looks like everything is perfect in right. their life, and you're like, "What is wrong with me? These people are on vacation in Tulum. I'm sitting here, can't even leave my house." You know, um, but. Obviously, they're dealing with their own stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I hear people all the time talk about, you know, the, oh, look at those people living better lives on Instagram or Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to me, it's like these are just, as Shakespeare said, you know, for all of us, uh, you know, the world is a stage and we're just actors, you know, on that stage. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, you know, Facebook and Instagram and TikTok uh, are just exactly that stage. And it, look, if people want to get on that stage and they want to broadcast their great life, good for them. Um, I don't believe in anyone living a great life, no matter how great it looks on social media or we're on a really big yacht somewhere. Um, once again, they're human. That just says to me everything I need to know. Yeah, the, We're all in the same you know, playing field. We mm -hmm. all have tremendous challenges. Um, you know, my brother is a, a, a priest and he did some service in, I think it was, uh, Ecuador and he helped build houses for 
basically people in the jungle who were without houses. And he said, these people have no money. They have barely food to keep them alive. He said, and they're the happiest people he's ever met mm -hmm. because they're not living a life of comparatives. Mm -hmm. They're all, you know, in that jungle struggling to survive. They all celebrate waking up every day because not all of them do. Right. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, it's, you know, that, that social media, it's sad that so many people are taken in by it. Yeah. But, you know, that's because, you know, people grow up un not understanding psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think it's one of the most important sciences in terms of emotional welfare. And yet in schools, you know, psychology is not even part of the narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Now when I look at, you know, a happy couple on Instagram, all I'm thinking of is her nagging him the whole time, you know, why'd you like that girl's picture? Yeah, I see I, beyond that. I, I'm like, it's not perfect at all. My favorite sayings is behind every gorgeous woman is a guy who's tired of effing her. Uh -huh, yep, yep. Not my saying, by the way. Uh, yep, but I, I think it. that that speaks about, you know... I usually I, like the Jack Nicholson one. You don't pay them to stay, you pay them to leave. Oh, that's, that that's funny. Uh, but that's for a <laughs> prostitute. I think that's what the joke yeah. is. Or yeah. a sex worker. Yes. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that, uh, you know, understanding things like habituation and dating and romance... Uh, in terms of going from lust to the potential for sexual intimacy is, is such an unknown thing. People yeah. are still chasing, you know, the everlasting gobstopper, mm -hmm. a Willy Wonka reference. Yeah. Um, the candy that never loses its flavor. Before we get to that, just one more thing about the irrelevance that I want to share. Sure. That I love is, uh, I don't know what approach this is, but the whole, uh, yeah, I'm crazy. Yeah, I'm going to die. That's my favorite. Yeah. Um, so basically what we're talking about is, you know, as you're sitting in your situation that you are uncomfortable with or whatever, whatever's going on, your brain is jumping to like the worst case scenarios. Sometimes it's, yeah. you're going to die. Yeah. You're going to die in this airplane or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, a lot of the times I'm trying to analytically do mental gymnastics out of the situation. To prove that you're safe. This is safe. This is fine. Uh, everything is okay. You're or, not going crazy. I'm not going crazy if that's what's happening or, uh, you know, when it's telling me that this is going to last forever or whatever right. it is, this breakup is going to last forever, whatever's going on. And, uh, you know, there's the other at mental ways of displaying irrelevance that we talked about. But my favorite, which would be, what is it, giving in to the, tell, uh, saying back to the brain pretty much the worst thing that it's saying. Yeah, kill me now. Right. When I'm having a pa panic attack and my heart is racing and I'm feeling dizzy and my knees are weak, and my brain is saying, you're dying of a heart attack, you idiot, go to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. Basically say to my brain, hey, kill me now. You right. know, I'm ready to <laughs> die. Uh, I've had some panic attacks playing tennis on a hot summer day. And my brain is 100% convinced that I'm an idiot to not give up tennis and go to the emergency room. I'm just mm -hmm. like, look, I'm, when my face is on the clay and I can't get up, Maybe someone will call an ambulance, but I'm willing to roll those dice. And I discovered this in a very powerful way. I was flying over the Rockies on my way to a ski trip, and the plane, I looked out the window. The wings were literally flapping. I'd never seen anything like it. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, my God, no engineer could have anticipated this amount of stress. Right. And so my brain said, you're basically going to crash into the next mountain and die. Mm -hmm. And I started getting really upset and, un and un uncomfortable with this idea, and I'm watching the wings, and I'm like, you know, well, the captain must know that this is happening. And, you know, so I'm trying to convince myself that I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm mm -hmm, safe. Mm -hmm. And the more that I started doing that, the more I'm sweating and, and feeling uh, very uncomfortable. And then I just said to myself, you know what? I said, today's the day I'm going to die. <laughs> I'm just like, this plane's going to crash. I've had a great life. Okay, let's crash today. Right. And right when I embraced death, all the anxiety and discomfort just completely evaporated. I felt like jumping up, turning to the whole plane. Hey, everyone, you just need to remind yourself it's okay that we're going to die today. And you're <laughs> right. going to feel absolutely which fine. Is, which no one's doing. Everyone's trying to do the opposite. Yeah, exactly. To, they're, all, they're all white-knuckling it and asking the flight attendant, is this okay? Is this okay? Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, again, no matter what signal of the day my brain is sending me about, you know, you're going to be depressed forever or, you know, you're going crazy. I now say to myself, all right, I'm crazy. Right. It just stops. I, I just don't engage with it anymore. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. just like, I'm, I'm crazy. Yeah. It gets the brain off of the warning. That's what the yeah. brain is doing. The brain isn't trying to, 
you know, F with your life. The brain is not trying to throw a monkey. The brain is just warning, 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 warning all the ways in which you might have a problem that needs attention. Mm -hmm. And and so the brain, you know, as a machine, it can't discern the legitimacy of it. And if there's an anxious signal that backs up the legitimacy, then the brain is going to warn you and keep you focused on it and think you need to escape. You need to prove that you're safe. Right. And when you say to the brain, I'm not going to engage in any of that. I'm going to completely disregard the signal, go on with my life path, and just let the signal be there as long as the brain needs to. Yeah. And that's the thing, too, is not to put a finish line on it. That's right. That's right. Because I've, I've done that a lot, too. You try to say this needs to be better by next Tuesday or whatever it is, and instead now it's I say it's not my department. Yeah. It's going to be there for as long as it's going to be there. I'm going to live off of the crumbs and just continue on my life's path. Yeah. But um, – yeah, it's another thing that you usually don't hear in treatment is, uh, you know, just basically just saying that. Usually it's the opposite. It's do the breathing exercises yeah. or do the read the book or take the medicine or yeah. whatever it is that is going to get you out of it. And saying instead of saying, again, paradoxically, no, I'm going to be like this forever. Yeah. Yeah. And then it starts to, again, I don't know how to approach this because I do want to tell people that the sort it of works. Like the light, the light at the end of the tunnel. You right. know what I mean? That's of, just the of why thing. we're you even know, talking about a lot all this. of people try to take the therapeutic responses or perspective, and then turn it into like an off button, which is the worst thing you can do. Uh -huh. You know, when you say, you know, I'm willing for this panic attack to be there and last as long as the brain chooses. You know, you can't like a minute later be like, "Why are you still here? I said the magic words." Right. You have to really own that permission. I accept given. it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But, and you have to show over and over again, right? That's right. You that, to, that you're not looking for relief. You're demonstrating the irrelevance of the signal. Yep. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Did you want to talk a little bit about sleep? Yeah. So we'll talk about sleep and then maybe end on some dating stuff. But um, we, we've touched on a, a lot of sleep, but um, I know that you have, I've done um, CBT for insomnia. Mm, your, CBTI, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I listened to a podcast that you did. You spoke about it similarly, but a little bit. Yeah, slightly different. Slightly different. Uh, my but, podcast. Uh, well, I saw. I saw a funny. Um, I posted a t funny tweet on my Instagram that said, uh, "It was a, one of those introverted tweets that said, sorry, I can't come out tonight. I have to wake up tomorrow morning.'" So I don't know if you see the. the Hold it a second. Okay. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I was laughing right. because it's so funny, but I'm like, that's the way that I yeah. have been living my life, you yeah. know? And a lot of times when you go to seek therapy for it, a lot of, a lot of it, uh, substantiates that signal and is trying to protect the sleep and trying to figure out ways to get to sleep. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about your approach and other approaches, which is like, you know, kind of the exact opposite because it's so paradoxical. Yeah. So, you know, once again, I, I have faith in the self-correcting brain. It's a beautiful machine. Uh, the brain is aware of what sleep is to its benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and the brain is aware of what things can interfere with it, allowing that wonderful thing to visit sleep. Uh, and the number one deterrent to sleep is the mattress that you sleep on. No, I'm only kidding. Right. <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> or the or the or the amount of thread count yeah. in your sheets. How much light's coming in? What type of pillow yeah, that you yeah. have? Um, Sound machine. <laughs> you know, don't do anything in bed other than sleep, sex. sleep and sex. Yeah. Other like, than that, <laughs> literally. That's where it gets so. That's why I was again like, well, I want to share your messages is because. As you're doing those things, I'm like, this can't be right. I've spent my whole life just fucking around in yeah, bed, watching yeah. TV. I never had a sleep problem. Yeah, watch out for blue light, by the way. That blue light will really <laughs> screw you up. Right, you right. Know? So the number one uh, deterrent from sleep is desperation mm -hmm. and and control. Yeah. You know, you put your head on the pillow. I love when people say, I need eight hours of sleep. It's mm -hmm. the funniest thing. You know, there is no need eight hours of sleep. There's right. no need seven hours of sleep. Um, you know, when I, I actually had a period of struggling with sleep, I my brain, not me, my brain kept me awake for two nights and then half of the third night. Mm -hmm. So I literally went two nights with zero sleep. And it's because I used to be, you know, very desperate 
to have my brain available to me to speak to patients who, you know, maybe expect wise words from Dr. Phillipson. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to disappoint. So I used to try to, you know, control my mental faculties by preserving sleep. And of course, that does the opposite. Right. And what's funny is here I went two nights, no sleep. I thought that Wednesday was going to be a train wreck. And it turned out, you know, I had some little moments of feeling somewhat off, but I was still almost totally there and still totally accessing, you know, kind of brain material. Living off the crumbs, Li well, which ended up being more funny? than crumbs. Yeah, but. It, it, I was ready to live off the crumbs. I went to work rather yeah. than canceling the day, which my brain told me to do. Mm -hmm. And there were no crumbs. It was still the, right. the you know, the fountain of, uh, you know, kind of I think uh, we flaunt. didn't say that before, but living off the crumbs is another approach, again, to get me to do yeah. things instead of canceling Being willing it. to live off right. the crumbs. Yeah. And, and so therefore, there was a lot more available to me than just crumbs, which I'm happy to say. Yeah. So desperation, you know, um, the goal of, you know, going to bed is to rest. Yeah. Um, and that means, you know, create a stage where rest and sleep might visit, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but you can choose rest. You can choose to have your head on a pillow. You can choose to think about lambs jumping over a fence or, you know, watching some river go down, you know, a mountain. Mm -hmm. um, when I wake up, I'll often put an audio book uh, in my uh, ear uh, with a one hour timer on it. And I'll just listen to the book. When you go to sleep. When I go to bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I go to you bed. You said wake up. That's why. Oh, well, okay. So, oh, know, when you wake up in the in the night from right, sleep. Right, when I oh, wake I up. Oh, I got you. I got you. So, uh, and, and I and so number 1, never ever ever look at the clock. When you wake up in the middle of the night. Right, but that was one of the CBTI. Yeah. Yeah, which I agree with that one. I agree, but listen, you might see the clock. Yeah, you yeah, know yeah. What I mean? Okay, that, that, I'm not saying it's a death sentence. Right. But, you know, if, if a lot of people, you know, look at the clock as a measure of how bad things are. Of course. Right. So when I, if I used to wake up and I'd look at the clock and I'd only slept for two hours, my brain would say, oh boy, are you screwed? Now you're not going to sleep for the rest of the night. And if I looked at the clock and there was only two hours left of sleep, my brain would be like, I'm never going to let you get back to sleep. It was always a lose. Mm -hmm. So one thing I avoid doing is looking at the clock. Um, and, you know, I just welcome the potential that sleep will visit by, you know, engaging in some distraction because my brain always wants me to problem solve when it wakes up middle of the night. What better time than in bed to think about all the worries of life? <laughs> right. Because nothing else is going on. Yeah. So, you know, I'll put in a little uh, audio book or I'll just, you know, bring my brain to topics that are a lot more conducive to sleep visiting. Mm -hmm. Some uh, methods, you know, like uh, a lot of it was like... Uh, picking a sleep window mm. that was actually shorter than because everyone thinks you need to be in bed longer to yeah. get more sleep. Right. So I kind of agree with that. I don't like rush to go to bed at like nine o'clock. I, I go to bed when yeah. I'm tired. Right. Um, well, those are more forms of desperation and trying to control sleep. Yeah. Right. As opposed to, you know, I would just say go to bed, uh, you know, when you're tired. Right. Um, and if you have an alarm, you know, don't hit snooze. I'm not a, I'm not a fan of people hitting snooze because, mm -hmm. you know, when you wake up, it's the first thing basically you've done is lied to yourself from the time that you set to get up. <laughs> right. Um, and, and just not look at sleep as something that, you know, is so necessary. Exactly. You know, it facilitates mental faculties. But once again, it's not a light switch on off. It's a continuum. Yeah. Yeah, because even the sleep window thing, like, again, I, I now I follow that loosely, but I don't want to live – my life with a sleep window because what if I my life changes and I have to sleep at a different sleep window same thing with the clock you know sure I'm not gonna go stare at the clock cool <laughs> I'm not gonna go stare at the clock but at the same time if I see the clock I'm approaching it more on a macro level right. like right. you just said of like it's not that necessary I always have the crumbs to live off of right I'm gonna rest I'm gonna it'll visit me when it visits me and I, it's not my department yeah. I have no control, you know, right. and since I've been doing that, I haven't done the other CBTI techniques. I haven't been getting out of bed to right. try to uh, change the pattern of yeah. the anxiety. I stay in the bed. You yeah. know what I mean? I look at the clock. I, it, it, it's, it feels so much better that way than the other CBTI, which was somewhat helpful. I guess it kind of like gave some kind of uh, it's like a regimen regimen and tool for it. But I, again, th I'm like... The people that I know that don't give a shit about sleep don't follow this regimen. That's right. And I want to 
go more that way, which yeah. I feel like this guide you more towards yeah. that life. And I think that's well, well put when you said the people who don't give a shit about sleep. And I, I couldn't agree more that, you know, um, they're not, you know, kind of only doing two things in bed. You know, they're not uh, avoiding coffee after noon. Yeah. Uh, if I drink coffee, if I'm in a restaurant on a Friday night, I, I can go to sleep right away. But if I drink coffee on a Monday night where Tuesday is my first day back at work, it seems like, you know, the whole alarm system has gone off. So, yeah. you know, just crazy brain stuff. And if it does, it yeah, does. Right. It's not my department. Not my department. You know. It's all about not giving a shit about everything. About the <laughs> about the that, that's what irrelevant. That's another word for irrelevance. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I know it's a little more yeah, scientific a little more nuanced than, yeah, than yeah. not giving a shit. <clears throat> all right, so we spoke about the sleep. Hope that was helpful to people. Um, you do a great podcast on sleep as well. With the thanks, it's, oh yeah, the podcast OCD is called stories. Sleep: The Hostage of Anxiety through the OCD stories. The OCD the, stories, okay. yeah, because. I'm sure people are going to want to listen to you more so they can hear you talk more in depth about certain things on, uh, I've given 14. And it, it's just on podcasts. your website. We can add the, add the That's link. right. The links. Yeah. My website is ocdonline.com. And that'll see choice. And I'll see the other podcast that That's you've right. done. If you want to like look more. And other into, articles that I've written on right. the topics. If you want to look more into the, the sleep situation. Um, and then I guess, yeah, lastly, We'll talk about a little bit of the dating stuff. Um, it's an area that I kind of struggle in. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I guess like I like what you said about, you know, the book, The Road Less Traveled um, and why you kind of recommended those chapters on love, being in love versus love or lust versus love or. Lust versus, let's say, intimacy, uh -huh. uh, you know, or. Uh, being in a loving relationship versus being in love, which we think of in more of a, a romantic or passionate concept mm -hmm. versus, you know, kind of the the loving uh, within a relationship of making someone a priority and really behaving toward that person uh, as someone that you really value without making them a trophy. And that's a really important nuance to kind of be aware of because most people who are trophy. Yeah, what do you mean by that, making someone a trophy? You've said that to me before. I tend to do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm dating a lot of trophies. Uh, um, <laughs> well, they look like trophies on Instagram. And then when you see them in person, they're like kind of like plastic cups. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Uh. So making someone a trophy <laughs> is kind of like the idea of trying to win someone over. Or um, I have a patient who literally said to me last week, it's really important to be with a very, very attractive person because people see you as being more successful or more valuable or, or more trustworthy or more more cool. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like he's very much into what I call brand management. Uh, you know, as a human, uh, he's trying to be seen as this very successful, cool, desirable, superior person. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that goes back to my term human, not mine, but, you know, the term human, where that completely eliminates this quest for elevating myself. Uh, you know, I want to elevate my tennis game or my sailing skills or my competence as a psychologist, but I would never think any longer in terms of elevating my person uh, because human is is just static. It doesn't go up or down. But to answer your question, turning someone into a trophy is to try to win them over in order to say, oh, look, look at how adequate I am because I won this prize. Mm. You know, look how what great skills I have because I won this prize. And look how great I must look in public because people are seeing me with this prize. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a, it's a very primitive uh way of, of looking at dating. But I mean, there's also, but there's attraction and you can kind of, obviously you have physical attraction towards someone. For me, I do, it makes me more attracted to someone when other people maybe are attracted to them. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, it just, you it, just signed up for another two months. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I'm going to break that down. I'll write the check. <laughs> no, nah, I mean, I guess I'm saying, get that I, I, listen, I'm human. <laughs> yes, you I'm are. I'm human, human. <laughs> Dr. Phillipson. <Steve>. Okay? <laughs> I have a lot of standards. Uh, no, nah, but I don't know. You it, see what you just said, and, and you know, you're not it, alone. It, it makes you, it, 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 it's an attractive thing. I don't know. It, it, 
It's not. It's not supposed to be attractive when uh, other people find your person attractive. If you're living a centered life, uh-huh. uh huh, and that's that's sort of because the end goal is me being attractive. Yeah, we could, we could do a two hour podcast <laughs> just on being centered because uh, it's right. a very difficult thing to achieve for a human being to be centered. Being centered means for that sure. you don't look for anything to substantiate how you see yourself. You know, yes. to I got me, you, got you. Okay. you know, I'm just human and right. therefore, you know, we're all in the same mud hole. We're all equal in my opinion. So mm-hmm. I, you know, if someone said, oh, your girlfriend is beautiful, I wouldn't think, oh, wow, that says something about me that this beautiful woman. Yeah, I don't know if I'm thinking about, about me. I'm just, I'm just saying I'm well, you, physically. No, you said I you just find more her more attractive if other people find her more attractive. We have it on tape. Yeah, we're going to cut that out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not thinking, I'm, I'm, so, I'm not like thinking, yeah, I guess I am thinking of them a little bit. Yeah. But I'm more so just out with someone. I think that they look super hot Great. and sexy. Great, that's your taste, that's your taste. Yeah. But how and the way they carry them. themselves to, and present themselves to the world and around me, I, I find it attractive. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, you know, I, I, it's great that Not that you, like, oh, this guy wants to fuck my girl. Like, this is so cool. Like, I don't have those thoughts, you know? It's just, like I said, just like the way that they move and having fun in, in public and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I certainly want to be with someone who has fun in public. Um, but once again, that doesn't speak about me. Uh, nor does it speak about this person because, you know, we relate to our partners through our own filters, through our own sense of priority mm-hmm. and the things that we connect with, you know, what we find attractive about them. Um, I think it's primitive to say, you know, what I find attractive about this person is how, you know, like when I hear male patients call a woman like super hot, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and, and it's like that that's their criteria. I'm like, well, you know, there are other facets and, you know, if you're with the super hot person for, you know, two years and you're, you're married, you've got kids, you know, you've seen them go to the bathroom with the door open, right. you know, all of a sudden super hot doesn't necessarily generate a super hot reaction. Mm-hmm. So hopefully you filled in this sense of compatibility, companionship, a sense of a partnership. Yeah. Where I mean, you need that stuff too, but. She could be but, super hot. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying I'm yeah. not. By the way, my you. hot is different than a lot of people's hots too. Everyone has different forms of like. Oh yeah. What's super hot? Yeah, absolutely. It's called taste. Yeah. He. Uh, another thing that you were were telling me is uh, my texting game was a little weak. <laughs> I was uh, going on a date, and you know, I'm like a little bit like, damn, why isn't this person texting me back? Um, and you told me to, to. Get out of that person's world yeah, and not right, use yeah. that as like a validation of whether yeah. the person likes you or not. I feel like a lot of people can relate like the to the lag that. time or yeah. even, even the game what they playing, text. the game playing, yeah. discerning what is game playing. Am I investing too much into this that I'm not receiving right. back? Once again, that goes back to the idea of like winning someone over versus finding someone that you find, you know, a value in, finding someone whose time spent with them is enriching to your sense of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Um, And so to me, uh, there's a wonderful saying that goes, the best way to be attractive is to being interested rather than interesting. So for, for males and females, I think it's really valuable to be interested in the person that you're with. Ask lots of questions. You know, find topics that there's mutual interest in in conversing about. Just mm-hmm. not just have it be the me show. Mm-hmm. But that might only happen in person. And if that's if that's sure. happening in person, that's good. Yeah. But if they, uh, you know, a lot of people call it uh, wishy washy, nonchalant, kind of like what happens afterwards when. People kind of just talk, they hang out a little bit, and then it just kind of like falls off a cliff and just kind of dies. The relationship. Where, Based on what I'm a little confused by. What like you're uh, you go out, you'll have like a great time. You know, a lot of girls say like, oh, I was texting this guy or whatever. It was great. And then it kind of just faded away. Uh, he stopped texting me, blah, blah, blah. You know, and, 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 and me, I, I would be if, if I got because it's happened to me, you know, because I date girls that don't text me back. 
That's, um, that's unbelievable. <laughs> I do. I do. It's like as long as they're not, if they text me back, I don't like them. <laughs> uh. don't, 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 don't take that literally. <laughs> don't take that literally. But that kind of is true. But I'm not actually following uh, that code. That's the old Groucho Marx. You know, I only want to belong to a club that wouldn't have me as a member. Maybe there's a little bit of that. Yeah. 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 No, but it's not that. It's just, <clears throat> I, I, I'm serious. It's not like, oh, like. I only want someone that plays hard to get. A lot of a lot of the cases, I, I want this person right. to text well, me. A lot of, a so lot all of I want is a person men, to text we, me. We won't talk about you in particular, but a lot of men find value in the chase. Once again, turning a woman into a prize or a trophy. Yeah. Um, and you know, a lot of women, uh, I, I think, you know, have a, a lot of a really good radar for when a man, you know, um, is trying to sell themselves uh, as opposed to just being really genuine and authentic and transparent. Yeah. Listen, I'm trying to find the one I want to cuddle on the couch. I want to do all the things. It's not just winning a trophy for the moment and moving on to the next one. Yeah. You know, so when I, when I do that, she just doesn't text me back. Yeah. Some of my male patients might ask, Steve, you know, what, what would you recommend I look for in the qualities of a, a partner that I make an investment in? And I say, that's really easy. It's the woman that after you have an orgasm, you're you really keep enjoying hanging talking out with her. to her. Yeah, for sure. You know, that, that she's uh, still. I've said that on this podcast too, in not so elegant ways with another word. Um, so you do actual like a uh, marriage I do marriage counseling. And, and I'm a sex therapist, but no one knows me for that. Interesting. Uh, and I do a lot of relationship counseling. And I also do a lot of business consulting in terms of like business communication skills. What do you, what do you, th so like, what are your thoughts on just the, the world of, of marriage and uh, the divorce rate and, you know, is, is, uh, should people seek counseling? Like, uh, like, uh, I don't, I don't hear great things, uh -huh. Steve. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think marriage is absolutely the most complicated sort of uh, endeavor that we put upon ourselves, uh, particularly when kids uh, enter the picture. I'm I'm a fan of marriage. I tell people when there's going to be children uh, involved, mm -hmm. uh, because I think you know raising children in that intact household, you know, gives hopefully a, a good start in terms of children being reared in an environment of stability uh, and intactness. But um, marriage uh, is extremely difficult because uh, a lot of people, you know, sign this kind of lifelong contract. And because it seems that their partner is going to be there unconditionally, then the, the maintenance, the, the effort to keep the relationship, uh, you know, a priority often can kind of uh, Wayne, uh, because it's like, oh, you know, this person's going to be here tomorrow, no matter what do I do today. So that can, in many relationships, create a stagnation, a lack of appreciation, a lack of effort. Mm -hmm. I always tell people marriage is like a, an old wooden ship. It needs tremendous maintenance and it never really ends. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's never like you cross the finish line with, with marriage or any relationship to say, oh, we've arrived. We no longer need to look to work on it. Like, uh, and do, do you encourage therapy like uh, early on or when do people? That's a know? really good question. It's funny because most people seek marital therapy when there's too much damage. And so statistically speaking, 60% of marital therapy cases end in divorce uh, because exactly what you just made that point that mm -hmm. uh, couples will go to marital therapy when it's sort of a, a ship that's not going to be revived. Uh, as opposed to kind of more early on to kind of work out some of the differences, get some education about what is considered to be, you know, effective relationship management. Mm -hmm. Communication skills obviously are a huge part of uh, managing a, any relationship, basically. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're starting right away. As soon as I find her, I'm getting her right in here. <laughs> Well, Forget that's kind two of, months. That's kind of funny two because years. believe it or not, and this mistake happens quite a bit with psychotherapists, hopefully more than psychologists, I actually couldn't work with you in marital therapy because you and I have established a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Uh -huh. If I now worked with you in a couple's, there's sort of a conflict of interest. You and I already have a bond. Interesting. And so what's the chances that she's going to think anything I say that might mm. be informative to her is because you and I had this prior alliance. And right. then when I 
you know, she tells me about all the shit you never told me about. And I start looking at you like, hey, you've got some significant work to do in this marriage. Steve, what happened? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were bros. Right. You know, and so in that regard, going from individual therapy to marital therapy is never, ever recommended. All right. Well, we're going to work on it. <laughs> you know, I, I just signed up for another two months of uh, learning how to. <laughs> well, we got to work on centeredness. Learning how to, you know, that's a, that's a comp not want my girl time. to be hot. Yeah. But, you know, seriously, you know, I think that uh, if we want to meet again, we want to really talk about centeredness because that's one of the most difficult parts of evolving within being human and, and having peace, mm. you know, rather than, you know, the anguish that so many humans carry with them. And that applies to the other stuff that we were talking about as well, like when uh, or or no, like being centered through an independent system, the gatekeeper. That's the a brain little bit different. That's a little oh, bit okay. different. I mentioned it a little bit in the choice article. I talk about, you know, uh, if I hold the door open for someone because it's my values to be giving mm. to a stranger and that person doesn't say thank you, my brain voice says, you know, scream, you're welcome, mm -hmm. you know, to really punish them for not giving me the gratitude that I deserve. Yeah. But in a centered world, that moment is complete because I fulfilled my goal to be generous and their response has nothing to do with me. It's really more yeah. about their perhaps lack of appreciation, you know, their own sort of being trapped in their own world. And so I can just go home, patting myself on the back. Hey, I, I, I was giving to this person and therefore I fulfilled my goal. I should uh, think about that when I'm fighting with people in the Instagram comments. Yeah, well, definitely. We, but that's kind of fun. There's another four months. I do. It has another four months. I guess I'm getting that Porsche after all. It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> um, all right. We're, we've done two hours. La last question, just so we can just tap on it real quick, is the, uh, we don't, we're going to have a little fun with it. But um, also it's kind of serious though, but then we can have fun with it in terms of the different treatments that are out there and things that people are doing, um, medication oh, right. being one of them. Right. But, you know, where I kind of have really truly gotten confused is is drug use. Yeah, A lot of people say, oh, you have anxiety? I smoke weed for my anxiety. Right. I do mushrooms for my right. anxiety. I took a I trip take to, alcohol for my anxiety. A lot of people alcohol. just use alcohol for And anxiety. a lot of people are doing like ayahuasca retreats yeah. in yeah. the jungle. And, you know, ketamine is another another big one. And it seems very, I'm not shitting on it. I'm not hating on it. I don't know. I wouldn't do it. It seems like, uh, again, for someone that's just constantly checking in on my status of my brain, um, I don't really want to be in those altered states of consciousness uncontrollably. Um, but, you know, it is out there and stuff. So uh, some people I know say it cured it. Some people say it didn't do anything. Some people I say, have said that it sent them into like psychosis. What say you yeah. <laughs> as a doctor? <laughs> well, you're, you're bringing up two facets of drugs. Uh, the alcohol use, uh, the pot use, that's self-medicating. That's using drugs uh, which are hopefully designed for recreation like alcohol, pot, maybe cocaine. Um, and it's using those to self-medicate. So a person might use cocaine or um, uh, like uh, an uh what's it called, like uh, heroin, uh, to medicate sense of inadequacy or depression. Mm -hmm. Person might use alcohol to medicate anxiety. Person might use pot to medicate a sense of uh, meaninglessness in, in life. The drugs that you're talking about, see if I can remember them, there's um, like ayahuasca is definitely one, uh, like special K, ketamine, mm -hmm. um, mush micro dosing mushrooms, uh, MDMA, um, I've heard, and this funny thing, um, they're using this, these, uh, magnets around the brain, transmagnetic, oh, TMS, transmagnetic stimulation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I see that as witchcraft, but these other medica drugs that you're referring to are, are thought of as being able to enhance a sense of insight, like, mm -hmm. you know, taking an LSD trip. Oh, that's another one. LSD taking a shroom trip or a, a ketamine adventure, like under the, and, and sometimes with pot, you can derive in the moment a, a, a deepened sense of insight or intuition about what's going on with you. Mm -hmm. It's kind of almost going back to the analysis we spoke about at the beginning. 
Um, and so, yeah, on these drugs, you can get a sense of insight as to, oh, you know, I'm not really afraid of being gay. It's just my brain malfunctioning. Yippee. But the thing is, is that the amygdala is still going to malfunction if, you know, after a month of your ayahuasca mm -hmm. and you're still going to feel frightened. And, you know, you may no longer be afraid of being gay or uh, her harming your children, but because the amygdala is malfunctioning and sending the terror signal, it's just going to reformat into a new topic. So people will go from, oh, I'm no longer afraid of offending God. Now I'm afraid that I'm going to hurt my kids mm -hmm. because the signal just chose a new topic. I always right. say OCD is an energy that looks for a face. Mm -hmm. And so these drugs can give you some potential temporary insight with your current issue, but it doesn't heal the amygdala. And that's really the system that needs to be focused on in terms yeah. of the conveyance of irrelevance. Yeah, I just wanted to get that out there a little bit because these things are becoming like more legitimized. Uh, yeah. the ayahuasca used to be like a jungle thing that you would do with your buddies. And now there's like they're building like right. hospitals around it. And right. There's still like the weird shaman there, but it's next to like an emergency room in case right. like you start having a heart Freaking attack out. or something like that, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, I've had a number of patients experiment with these, uh, you know, very popular um, up and coming uh, interventions. Um, and I can tell you, I have not had a single patient tell me, oh my God, they no longer need, need my services because these drugs did the trick for them. Mm -hmm. um, often you get this initial like temporary benefit. Oh, this is the greatest thing ever. And then like two, three weeks later, it's like right back to baseline. That's a good way to end it is uh, not that treatment, but your treatment and and choice and everything. You know, what's, what's usually the result that you see? Like what's the desired result sure. that people should look for? Because I know it's not yeah. completely getting rid of it, you know? Well, actually I use the term dormant. Mm -hmm. uh, when you uh, effectively and aggressively and appropriately apply these very, very powerful principles in, you know, it's called neuroplasticity, the reconditioning of the brain, the reformatting of the brain. Mm -hmm. So that's why I went from calling people I work with clients to patients because this therapy is literally brain surgery. Um, and so when a person engages in these treatments very aggressively in a disciplined way, the conditions can go dormant. So to have anxiety, um, you know, I've had patients reach up, reach out to me 10 years after they had originally uh, met success and they come back for some other issue. Um, I have a patient coming back because he's having a kind of a religious crisis and he wants to kind of process some philosophy and, and, and religious concerns. Um, and his OCD is completely still dormant. It's in the can. He hasn't had, you know, a day of an OCD episode in 10 years now. And that's not so unusual. I wouldn't say he's cured, but his brain, you know, is, is reformatted in a way that if it even gives a little shadow of like anxiety, he looks at it like, bring it on. Let's see what you got. I'm ready for you. Mm -hmm. And the brain uses like, yep, 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 yep. Kind of like, okay, okay. I was just kidding. Right. Because, you know, anxiety is nothing more than a warning that you're having a crisis. When you say to that warning, let's see what you got. The brain's like, just, you know, it wasn't, it didn't mean it, didn't mean it, right. you know, because you're no longer substantiating the warning. So the goal of therapy is to provide lifelong skills, like mm -hmm. treating depression, you know, and there's a lot of work in the cognitive realm. Mostly what we've spoken about today is the behavioral part of the science that I practice rather than the cognitive part, meaning the thinking about how we see ourselves, how we see the world around us, how our brain talks to us, and how we misconstrue and interpret that brain voice for reality and, and you know, really dark messages and thinking that that's the deep, dark me speaking, mm -hmm. which is so tragic when it's just the machine talking. Yeah, and, make, and being conscious and mindful enough to know the distinction that's and, right. to, and to continue that's on. That's right, and being, you know, the gatekeeper choosing what am I going to substantiate and mm -hmm. what's a rational thought. The brain lies a lot. Right. You know, the brain might say, oh, don't go to the party. You won't have a good time. That's a lie. How does the brain – doesn't have a crystal ball that shows me whether I'm going to have a good time or not. Mm -hmm. And although the brain might say don't go to the party or I'm feeling really blue, so I don't think I'm going to have a good time or there won't be enough crumbs to make it worthwhile, actually going most often produces a response which is like, oh, I'm really glad I went. Um, all right. Well, I hope everybody learned something from this. I hope it was helpful for people. You're a fascinating guy 
and doctor. That's why I wanted to share the message. If people, ha you know, I want to say, I don't know if you want them to get in touch with you. How can people get in touch with you? I know you have like a, a big practice here to help people for yeah. a variety of things. So how and, can and I kind of guide the audience? Yeah, there's, well, the center has about 18 therapists with different levels in their we do a lot of training here, so different levels in their education. Um, like I said, we work with people around the world. Uh, some of the therapists are licensed in many different states. So we do, you know, in we do in-person treatment. We do uh, video uh, work, um, and and sure, we have a, we have because we have a great range of therapists with different levels of training. We offer a sliding scale, basically that starts at around fifty dollars an appointment. Okay. So people can find out about that at your website. Yeah, ocdonline.com. I'll put or it in the link. they can link. call the center mm -hmm. um, and uh, speak to my administrator and make some appointments. All right. Well, we have to do this again sometime. You know, I, I, know, I know we have a, a lot more to talk about. We could talk all day. But <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time. Like I said, as soon as I started getting the message and applying it, I wanted to share it with others and uh, hopefully it can help them as well. I, I appreciate most of all, as I said, your, your faith and trust. And the way that you apply the principles that are being offered, that's totally on you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I hope you give yourself a lot of credit for the work that you're doing and the, you know, the discipline that you're applying to this process. Yep. And next thing you know, next time, uh, next thing we're going to work on is getting all the baddies. We'll, we'll know that you're uh, you're doing very well when you're you're dating a woman who's not super hot. Ah, oh, <laughs> damn it! <laughs> all right, thank you guys. <laughs> That was a perfect way to end it. <laughs> <laughs>